the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Fuck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, today I'm very excited because this is the day that you promised that you're going to start to read Robin Hood. That's right. Today we begin to read Robin Hood. And and you were right. Right about what? You said they were going to be in those wonderful Walt Disney drawings, and they are. I already looked. And you're happy with them? Oh, I should say I am. That's wonderful. And I'm anxious to hear you read the beginning of the story of Robin Hood. So could you please start reading the funnies now? Puck the comic mm-hmm. weekly. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do... Let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, Big Ben Boat. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Faint and punch and dodge and twist. It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist. Big Ben Bolt and his trainer, Spider, are on a barnstorming trip around the country. They go to various towns and box the local favorite. Ben has offered $1,000 to anyone who can stay three rounds with him. In a western town, Ben finds he is to fight a husky, educated Indian named Chief Tallpine. Spider has been threatened by an Indian with a knife who warns him that Ben better let Chief Tallpine win. Spider goes away from the Indian and says quickly to Ben, Hey, listen, kid. These tomahawk heavers want to hoot and holler laughing boy into a win, so don't tarry, huh, pal? Ben nods and says, I'll do my best, Spider. Then Spider looks across the ring. He sees another Indian smearing grease on the face and body of Chief Tallpine. So whenever the chief is hit by Ben, his gloves will slide off the Indian's body. Spider runs across the ring and says, Hey, 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 nix on that grease, pal. That's strictly NG with a commission. The Indian replies, Small man has large mouth of crocodile. He goes on, last picture, top row. His foul name of Hamidkar, Lord of Warriors, provider of this lucky unguent we apply to Chief Tolpine. Unguent, my eye. That stuff's plain grease. And I... Hey! Suddenly, he's grabbed from behind and pushed toward Ben's corner. First picture, bottom row, by another Indian. Spotter yells, Hi, Ben! These jokers are loading their scalpel with so much grease, your punches will slip off them like a cat off an icy roof. Before Ben has time to do anything, the bell rings, signaling the fight to begin. Ben gets up, saying, I wish me luck, Spider. Spider exclaims, Luck you don't need. What you got used for is non-skid gloves. Oh, why did I come on this rat race anyway? Determined to finish the fight fast, Ben leads with a jolting right. A right that glides smoothly off the chief's pomaded jaw. Seeing that his punches are sliding off, Ben determines to fight in close. Last picture, he clinches, but fails to get a hold on his opponent's slippery arms. And then the chief lands a hard, punishing left to Ben's midsection. Oh, it isn't fair. It isn't fair for that man to put that grease on him, is it? Why, no, there's even a rule against that sort of thing by the boxing commission. I hate people who cheat. And these men who are fighting Ben are cheaters. Yes, Ben can never beat that Indian, or can he hurt him because his blows are sliding off. But then the Indian could hit Ben all the time and hurt him. Well, we'll find out what happens next week. Now? Now can we go over the page, please? Because I'm sure Prince Valiant will be there. All right, over the page we go. And you're right. Here he is. And you remember last week that Val had disguised himself and slipped into the castle of Sigurd Holm, a cruel tyrant who is mean to the people. Yes, he slipped into the castle to get evidence of Sigurd's cruelty. And he found it. And then, under cover of night, Val escaped from the castle by lowering a rope from a platform overhanging a deep abyss where a deep, wild river flowed. But the rope wasn't long enough for Val to get all the way down, and then when we left him, he was hanging in the air. And if he drops, he could be killed dead, and and he can't get up that rope to the castle. Well, let's read now and see what happens with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. Blackness of night, Val comes to the end of his rope. 
He knows he can do nothing in the darkness, so he makes a loop in the rope so he can hang more easily without wasting his strength. In their second picture, top row, he hangs in the dark, waiting for the first rays of dawn. Last picture, top row, in the castle, in the midst of the noisy dinner, Sigurd the tyrant sits thinking. Prince Valiant, he's sure, will return to the castle. And word has just been brought to him that Jarl Oder, one of his men, has disappeared, leaving his clothing in his sleeping stall. Sigurd wonders if there could be any connection. He decides to make sure. First picture, second row, he suddenly leaps to his feet and shouts, Search the place! Find Oder, or the spy who has taken his place! Finally, the first rays of dawn begin to break through the night, and there is sufficient glow for Val to see his position. To the left, he sees a cliff of clay. He draws his knife, then starts to swing back and forth. With each swing, he comes closer and closer to the cliff. And then, he lets go of the rope, first picture bottom row. The swing throws him against the cliff. Quickly, he plunges his knife into the clay and holds himself still. <coughs> then slowly... He begins to chop little footholds. Slowly but carefully, he works his way down the slippery cliff. And none too soon, for from above in the castle, he can hear the baying of hounds and the shout of men searching for him. Finally, he reaches the bottom of the cliff. He knows he cannot escape by land, for the hounds would pick up his trail. So he stays in the wild, rough river, working his way upstream. Last picture, dawn is breaking, when he at last finds a hiding place under a bridge. The stream has wound its way under the very gates of Sigurd's house. And there Val decides to hide in the cold, cold water and work out a plan to escape. Oh, I'm so glad that he escaped and got down in the water to hide. So am I. I was afraid he'd find himself hanging so high above the stones... And the river below with no way to get down. But but he's still in a dangerous place, right under the gate of Sigurd's house. And in that cold water. Oh, I'm afraid he's going to have a rough time before he gets away from there. Do you think that he will sit in that water until night? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Oh, look, there's Uncle Remus. And his tales of Brer Rabbit. Please, quick, read that, please, quick. All right, say the magic words with me. Here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Brer Rabbit. Hippity hoppity, make it a habit to give us music for old Brer Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Just hang any kind of money in front of Brer Rabbit, and you has got a busy creature. Brer Rabbit sees a sign which reads, Wanted, Red Ghost, Reward, $70. Brer Rabbit says, well, red, white, or blue, I is getting me a ghost. And in no time at all, Burr Rabbit is at home dressing up in his best clothes. He puts imitation money in his hat band, in his coat sleeves, leaves some sticking out of his pockets, and even makes a bow tie out of the imitation money. And then... Then he goes for a walk out in the country. So any robber or red ghost can see he's loaded with money. As he passes the woods... Suddenly, the red ghost pops out from behind a tree. Sticks a gun in Br'er Rabbit's chest. Kick your hat and coat all your life. Instead of handing over his money, Br'er Rabbit dashes like a streak of lightning. Last picture top row, the red ghost shouts, Stop! I'll blow you out of nickels and dimes. Br'er Rabbit answers, Well, you ain't got bullets that fast, Br'er Ghost. After Br'er Rabbit, the ghost goes. First picture about a row. Around the bend in the road, Br'er Rabbit goes. Br'er Ghost shots go wild. Over the fence, Burr Rabbit goes. And by the time the ghost catches up with him, he sees Burr Rabbit hiding behind Burr Bull. The red ghost comes to a quick stop. Burr Rabbit says, He's insulting you, Burr Bull. Blow your horn. And down goes the bull's head. And he goes after Burr Ghost. Hey, hey, wait! But the bull won't wait. And last picture, the ghost hangs in a tree. But now his head is out from under his red hood. And who do you think it is? Old Br'er Weasel looking awful sheepish. And Br'er Rabbit says to the bull who was standing under the tree snorting, 
Uh, just hold him there, Bill Bull, while I goes for the sheriff and the reward. And Uncle Remus says, uh, You don't have to disguise to make yourself what you is. Yes, it was. <laughs> Brer Rabbit had it all planned. He had him right into the pasture in front of the bull. <laughs> and then when the bull saw red, then he got mad and butted Brer Weasel right into the tree. <laughs> yes, I'll bet it'll be a long time before Brer Weasel wears red again. Yes. Well, now... Oh, now, uh, when are we going to read Robin Hood? Oh, I see. You're kind of anxious. Well, let's go to the very last page of the first section, then, and see what we find there. Oh, oh, it's Flash Gordon. And you remember, he's returned to Earth after having so much trouble with the giants on the planet Rhea. Yes. And, and do you think that he will get to Earth safely? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go on the very last page of the first section with Flash Gordon. rigga rigga doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash is in his rocket ship on his way back to Earth. Suddenly, he receives an urgent space radiogram. Observatories have sighted what appears to be giant comet plunging into Earth's orbit. Please investigate. Quickly accelerating, Flash steers in pursuit of this ominous invader of the skies. Closing in on the comet, Zarkov, Flash's assistant, studies his instruments. He says grimly, we can't go too near the superheated gases, Flash. The nucleus alone is bigger than the Earth. It'll obliterate our planet if they collide. Last picture, top row. As Flash's rocket cautiously approaches the comet's head, a second tail suddenly flares back from the flaming mass. It's as if the berserk comet is deliberately trying to cremate the Earthman's puny rocket in a blowtorch blast of gas and molten metal. First picture, bottom row. Fighting desperately to escape from the path of the searing comet tail, Flash jams the throttle forward to the full blast position. The abrupt change of course hurls Dale and Zarkov against the cabin wall. He gasps. I never saw a comet like that before. Why, it acts as if it were alive and had a brain. Flash has no inkling of how right he is. Hidden within the comet's flaming mass is a round, electronically insulated control ship commanded by Pyron, a strange genius who has mastered the secrets of the fiery world of the comets. From his weird control ship, Pyron, last picture, can guide the comet at will. Swiftly, he changes course to engulf the Earth rocket in the comet's fiery tail, and he exults to his aid. <laughs> Look, Flama! A backwash is almost upon them. Isn't that amazing? A man can guide a whole comet and control it himself. Yes, that is amazing. Why, that's just like someone trying to guide the Earth and send it through the skies any way they want to. I hate people who are always trying to do the things that this man Pyron is. What will happen? Will, will Fleischer's rocket ship melt if it hits it? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now... And will we soon be to Robin Hood? Well, we're getting close, but look. You know who's on the first page of the second section? Oh, yes, Dagwood and Bundy. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie and her friend, Mrs. Dribb, have asked Dagwood to take care of Mrs. Dribb's twins while the women go shopping for hats. Last picture, top row, Mrs. Dribb hands her two crying twin babies to Dagwood and says, If they cry, just warm their bottles for them. Dagwood looks at the howling twins and exclaims, If they cry... <laughs> First picture, second row, he's in the kitchen, heating the milk for the babies who continue to howl. I didn't do anything. I don't deserve this. A few minutes later, he's in the living room trying to get the babies to drink their milk. It's your milk. It's good. Nummy, 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 goody. Won't you even try it? The babies answer. 
The postman comes and quickly goes. Dagwood yells to him last picture, second row. Mr. Beasley, help me! No, nothing doing. I got to deliver my mail. First picture, third row. Dagwood sticks his head out of the window and yells to his neighbor, Herb Woodley. Herb, I need you! Ah, you got yourself into it. Now get out of it by yourself. Finally, last picture, third row. The babies fall asleep. Dagwood tiptoes to the sofa and lays them down. Ah, at last they fall asleep. Thank goodness. My nerves were ready to explode. Suddenly, the phone rings first picture, bottom row. It's Blondie who's calling to find out how the babies are. And she hears Dagwood yell, Oh, you woke him up! And he begins to cry. <laughs> and last picture, the babies, Dagwood and Daisy the dog, howl and howl and howl while the women shop for the hats. <laughs> <laughs> Dagwood, look funny lying there and crying with the babies. Yes. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. <laughs> yes, it was. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, there's Roy Rogers. Read that, please. Very well. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Hi yip hi oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi oh <laughs> Roy and a man named Corny Maxson have discovered that a tough young boy named Shanks is posing as Teddy Knox, whose father owns the Box K Ranch. Roy has ridden on to the ranch to see what he can find out, leaving the boy with Corny Maxson. But the boy escapes. As Roy is talking to Lawyer Carstairs, who's in on the crooked deal, the boy sneaks up behind Roy with a raised shovel, intending to knock Roy out. Roy is saying, Now listen, Carstairs, a note in the locket we found said Teddy Knox is held captive here in the Box K. I intend to find him. As the boy swings, he steps on a twig. Roy turns around quickly. Hey! Missing the blow of the shovel. It's you, huh? Yeah, and I got away from your peddler pal. <clears throat> the boy tackles Roy, and as he falls to the ground, Carstairs picks up a rock and knocks Roy out. <clears throat> I abhor violent shanks. Who is this man? The boy says, last picture top row. Why, it's Roy Rogers, and he knows plenty. Enough to expose our scheme to steal the Knox Ranch. <laughs> Meanwhile, Corny Maxim, who has gone to town for the sheriff, is nearing the Box K Ranch at a dead gallop. The sheriff is saying, Record lawyer Costas wouldn't know if the real Teddy Knox was held prisoner like you suspect. Corny answers, Well, perhaps, but you must see the proof Roy Rogers and I found in the locket. Stitch in time, save nine. They pull up at the ranch, and the sheriff sees Carstairs standing in front of the house. Oh, uh, howdy, Carstairs. Have you seen anything of a cowboy named Roy Rogers? Carstairs replies, Why, I never heard of him, Sheriff. Last picture, Corny sees Roy's horse running loose, and he says, Carstairs is trifling with the truth, Sheriff. That's Roy's horse, Trigger. The sheriff looks at Carstairs and says, And where's Rogers? Carstairs says to himself, Oh, blast it, I told Shanks to get rid of Roger's horse. believe Corny Maxim and make Carstairs turn Roy loose. Well, I hope it turns out that way. And then maybe they'll throw Carstairs and that mean boy in jail. Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now is it time for Robin Hood? Now it's time for Robin Hood, and you'll find the story of Robin Hood over the page. So over the page we go. And here it is. Here it is, and here we go with the story of Robin Hood. <laughs> It's merry, merry England in the days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. So music, hi-ho! It's the year 1190, 762 years ago. King Richard the Lionheart summons his knights to the Third Crusade, which will take him far from England across the sea. The Earl of Huntington prepares to join the king at his castle. His men are busying themselves, preparing for the trip to join King Richard. Second picture, the Earl says to his daughter's nurse, Oh, find my daughter quickly, good Tib. We leave at once for Nottingham. Yes, my lord. And she makes her way through the crowd of busy men looking for the Maid Marian, who is the daughter of the Earl of Nottingham. But she can't find her anywhere in the courtyard or in the castle. And she exclaims, The gadabout, playing Willow the Wisp at a time like this. Marian! Meanwhile, in a nearby meadow, last picture top row, the maid Marion sees a handsome young man shooting arrows at a handkerchief tied to a stick. With a long pole, she pushes the stick every time he shoots at the handkerchief, moving it. 
He walks forward and sees her hiding behind the bushes. And he exclaims, Aha, so it was you who made my arrows miss the mark. He starts to run away. He trips her with his bow, first picture bottom row. <laughs> There's more than one way to bring down a quarry. Marion! And then Tib, Marion's nurse, makes her way through the forest and sees Marion, a little must from her fall, brushing the leaves from herself. Saints above, look at you, and with the Lord Earl waiting. Marion gets to her feet and tells Tib to inform her father that she'll join him presently. As she walks off, she says to the handsome young man, And you, good rogue, have my gracious leave to pine and fret till my return. Oh? Why should I pine and fret? Last picture, Marion, with a soft look in her eye, says, To please a lady. Oh, the maid Marion. I remember her from the story. She was lovely and nice. Yes, she was. And, and is that nice young man Robin Hood? I'm afraid you'll have to wait and see if he's the fellow who becomes Robin Hood. Well, I just know he is because he's in love with the maid Marion and she was in love with Robin Hood. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Oh, it's a nice beginning. And he's so handsome. Yes, he is. And now it's time for Dick's Adventures. So let's go over to the very last page of Puck the Comic Weekly. All right. And there he is. See? Here is Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. That's some music for adventure to stick. Dick is lying in a hammock, sound asleep. His dad and mother, who are working in the garden, see him, and his dad says, Oh, he's in dreamland again, mother. I wonder what he's dreaming about this time. And in Dick's dream, he goes back, back, back. Back to the early days of America, the year 1811. And it's just after the Battle of Tippecanoe on the Wabash River. A brave young American general, General Harrison, has just defeated warriors of the Indian chief Tecumseh. And the surviving Indians are fleeing northward, first picture, top row. The warriors had been led by an Indian named Elk Swatawa, whose nickname was the Prophet, a terrifying figure with one eye. The prophet is a twin brother of the famous Indian leader named Tecumseh. Tecumseh was not in the battle because he had warned his brother, the prophet, to avoid open warfare with a white man until more braves could be brought up and victory for the Indians would be certain. But the prophet had not listened to Tecumseh, and the Indians were defeated. Having outdistanced Harrison's pursuing warriors, the prophet directs the Indians with him to go to a rendezvous on the far side of Lake Erie. And in a moment, the Indians melt in the surrounding wilderness. Then alone, last picture, second row, the prophet strikes east across the vast trackless region lying between Ohio and Michigan, known as the Black Swamp. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture, a young boatman ferrying down from the village of Detroit with supplies for one of the isolated fur trading posts suddenly notices two chiefs circling each other with drawn knives. It is Dick who stares in amazement as he sees the two chiefs, who are Tecumseh and his brother the prophet, alone at the edge of the forest at Sandusky Bay at the river's bank, fighting a deadly duel. Oh, Tecumseh hates his brother because he spoiled Tecumseh's plans to gather the tribes and beat the white people. Is that right? That's right. Oh, I hope Dick doesn't get mixed up in that duel because those chiefs hate the white man. Well, we'll find out next week. Now, look underneath Dick's adventures. Here's Rusty Riley. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that because Rusty and Tex and Pete were on a boat that was delivering some horses to Florida. And a man named Blackie Kirk had the boat run aground during a storm, hoping the horses would drown so he could collect insurance on the horses. And Tex is the boys, and, and one of the sailors named Clem Clem, who's a nice man, they're on an island, and they're safe, and they hope that they can get the horses off the ship but, but I wonder if they will. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Far from the island, Blackie Kirk and Captain Crump, who has helped Blackie in his attempt to sink the boat have pulled into the dock to call the Coast Guard and report the accident. Second picture, Captain Crump comes out of a store after making his call and says, Well, Blackie, I called the Coast Guard from the store. They want us to wait here till they come. Blackie replies, Well, they probably want you to sign a report. 
And after that, we can go north and collect a nice insurance check for those valuable racehorses. Meanwhile, last picture top row, on the island where they have escaped, Rusty and Pete come upon a body lying on the sand. Rusty exclaims, Mike's a radio man from our ship, Pete. He's in bad shape. Pete says, Hey, I'll get Tex. I think this beach runs clear around the island so I won't have to cross the rocks. A short time later, Tex, Clem, and the boys are kneeling over the radio man. After a careful inspection, Tex says... Hey, you're going to be okay, Sparks. Hey, what happened to you, boy? Sparks says, oh, That man, Kirk, must have gone nuts. I was in the ship's launch with him and the skipper. And suddenly, for no reason, he socked me with a wrench and chucked me overboard. They help Sparks to his feet and get him down to the shore in front of the ship. Last picture, Tex says, Well, there's the ship, Sparks, and there are 12 horses aboard her. We mean to try to get him off while the tide is low. Why, that ship isn't on the rocks. It's just a ground on a sandbar. If we can get aboard, I'll have a radio working in a jiffy. Come on, let's go. Clem says, Well, I ain't much on maritime law, but I got an idea we'd have some salvage money coming if we save her. will go on the ship and, and he'll send a message to the Coast Guard and tell what's happening and maybe the Coast Guard will, will put Blackie and Captain Crump in jail when they get them. Well, that's something that could happen. We'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Beagley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's the date, and the date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puff the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.